Good afternoon, everyone. We have a number of individuals still uh, dialing in, so we'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webcast. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're excited to uh, have you on today's call where we'll be discussing the very first ETF that will focus on capturing uh, breakout stocks as identified by Investors Business Daily. Before we kick things off, just a few housekeeping items. First, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this webcast. Uh, you'll see in your web browser there's an area for you to submit questions. We'll get to as many of those as possible at the end of uh, today's webcast and any that we are not able to address. Uh, an innovator consultant will be with you uh, shortly after the call ends today. There will be a, re a replay and slides will be available after this webcast. Uh, we will be sending those out uh, once the webcast is approved. Move to the next slide. Today, I'm joined by Justin Nielsen and Chris Gessel at Investors Business Daily. Justin and Chris are two widely followed executives over at IBD and were instrumental in the creation of the index that is underlying our new breakout opportunities uh, ETF. Uh, before we kick it off, uh, kick it over to Justin and Chris, uh, just a few other uh, things that we want to introduce Innovator, uh, which is an ETF issuer with a long history in the ETF space dating back to uh, 2002 and the founding of PowerShares. And, and many of the uh, employees here at Innovator have spent their entire careers within the ETF uh, space. One of the reasons why we're really excited about our partnership with IBD is that uh, we have an exclusive relationship with them to bring their best ideas, uh, most widely followed lists uh, to market in the ETF structure. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the IBD 50 and our ETF, the Innovator IBD 50 ETF. Uh, what's beneficial about being able to put the IBD strategies in the ETF wrapper is the tax efficiency that uh, the ETF wrapper provides. And so we're excited to extend that to the breakout concept that we'll be introducing uh, today. There are a couple of things that we want to uh, highlight on today's webcast. The first is uh, we want to talk about what breakout stocks are. Uh, why does it matter for your portfolio? Uh, how can it make a difference in your portfolio? There's a lot of research on momentum investing, but we think that the breakout concept is something that has been time tested by IBD and will provide investors a unique exposure. Second, IBD will be talking about the investment merits behind the breakout concept. Uh, they've, like I said, uh, uh, research this factor uh, for uh, several decades, and I think the performance will speak for itself. Finally, we want to talk about the new IBD ETF that we'll be bringing out uh, this Thursday, September 13th, trading under the ticker BOUT. We want to show how it's going to provide investors unique exposure to not only the existing IBD ETFs and strategies, but also to some of the most popular uh, and, and widely followed momentum-based ETFs in the market uh, today. So with that, let me kick things over to Justin and Chris. Thanks, Graham. It's good to be uh, here. I'm Chris Gessel, uh, head of content here at IBD, and with me is Justin. Hello. Welcome uh, to the webinar. Thank you for having us. Um, and I'm uh, director of market research. Um, so, you know, I'll just kind of kick it off real quick and let people know a little bit about who Investors Business Daily is for those that aren't familiar with us. Um, we were founded in 1984 by William J. O'Neill. And, you know, this wasn't his first venture. Uh, he actually had quite a bit of history in research and um, you know information that he was giving to institutional clients since the early 60s um, our mission statement to help our customers make more money in the stock market simple as that he bill you know again what he was doing was he was 
providing all this information to institutional investors, but at a certain point, he really wanted to kind of transfer some of that knowledge base over to the retail investor, and the newspaper was a really great way to do that. So he founded that in 1984. And over the last 30 years, we've continually tried to create new tools, features, products that are all designed to help investors find the stocks with the greatest potential. As we move on, uh, what really makes IBD different uh, than other financial publications and uh, other investing um, outfits is that we're focusing on strength, but not just technical strength or fundamental strength. We put them together and we really, we, we have found over many years of actual practice, testing, creating indexes that once you put technical strength with fundamental strength, that's where you get really outsized returns. Uh, we've always been, you know, focused on concentration. There's typically in any market cycle just a handful of leaders that uh, really drive the biggest gains in the market. So we've always been uh, focused on that. And in, in the same way, you know, when we're talking about strength, it's not simply, uh, you know, biggest or most well known or dominant in the industry. It could be a young upstart. And one way that we, you know, discover these these stocks that are emerging are looking for stocks that are breaking out, making new highs, and that's a big flag to us that there's something going on. Uh, a lot of people, you know, know that that uh, this uh, sometimes results in in a lot of turnover because the market is changing. It's moving, you know, from sector to sector. Uh, in in an individual portfolio, that may be difficult. Maybe you don't want to do all that trading, or you're worried about the the cost of commissions. But in ETFs, it's fantastic because uh, just the the way ETFs work, for tax reasons and and uh, the you know the way that uh, in kind trading uh, plays out, it really high turnover becomes a, a, another area of strength. So what some people would consider consider a, a weakness about IBD, it actually when it in I, uh, when it comes to ETFs, turnover, high turnover is we we really take advantage of that, and it's something that's uh, uh, good to have. And that has been one of our uh, best things about partnering up with Innovator is you know for the first time we found someone that we felt understood. Of. Yes, <laughs> they really, we believe it's good, and they were like, no, we agree. And yeah, so right. it was a really great thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then of course uh, Bill O'Neill. I mean, and this started back when he was. You know, first uh, in in the uh, securities business, uh, he started looking at the best stocks each year, and and from that drawing uh, rules on you know what they looked like before they made their moves, uh, how to hold them, when to sell them, and it's just part of our DNA that we're rules based, and that, and that's why it works so well when we move to these indexes and then ETFs because. They're all automatic. We're not, uh, you know, once we once we decide on the on the formula, the algorithm, we stand back and and we let it run. So uh, it really takes the emotions out of the investing. So we we really do have a long history of uh, publishing lists. Uh, this is something that you know Bill was a very big proponent of at the very beginning. And of course, part of that is because he was so revolutionary and putting stock market data into a computer. You know, that's something that he started doing in the early 60s. And so because we had all of that, you know, kind of, you know, some people would even call him the grandfather of, of algos because he was doing that so early with, you know, the, the, the computer based. So, you know, we have this long history of published lists and they have significant outperformance relative to the market. That's what we go for. We're we're not looking to be average. We're looking to really get those outsized returns whenever possible. And, you know, we have over half a century of uh, Bill's investing experience kind of developed these guiding principles. Again, as Chris said, we focus on strength and, you know, it's, we're using a half a century of investing experience, not, not theoretical. This is like, this is where he made his money. This is how he funded you know, IBD. Funded IBD because... Now, let's be honest, uh, a newspaper is not a very easy thing to have as a private company. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really, the it was kind of a hobby that he was, you know, able to fund with his stock market profits, uh, you know, being a very successful investor himself. So over the years, we've published lists and uh, uh, 
different indexes, and one of the best known is the IBD-50. And that actually started in 2003. And so, you know, we're, uh, as we call up this chart with the, gr uh, with the graph on it, uh, in 2003, right after, this is around the time of the, the, the tech uh, meltdown, the bear market from there uh, had come to an end. And, uh, you know, we decided to, to create a list that would be published in the paper each week that would be an idea list. And we soon found that it was uh, performing pretty well. So what's nice to, to know about this, this is not a back-tested list or anything like this. It was published week in and week out since 2003. These are, you know, the, the performance you see here is based on the, the stocks that actually were in the list at the time. There's no elements of su survivorship bias. And you can see there's strong outperformance. Uh, you know, typically the, you know, growth stocks, which the, the IBD 50 really focuses on, it really outperforms in up markets. It will, you know, pull back uh, quite a bit in down markets. And we've, uh, in, a, in our ETF indexes have worked in some market timing rules to minimize those uh, effects. But overall, very strong performance. Mm -hmm. And for those uh, people that are longtime subscribers, uh, you might remember that when we first launched this, it was actually the IBD 100. Mm -hmm. um, we, we kind of narrowed the list down to the IBD 50 uh, a, a while into a while into it, um, around 2010. And the reason was because we found that the top 50 performed so much better than the bottom 50. Uh, so a lot of our subscribers were saying, you know, we really, it's great having 100 stocks, but we really don't have time to look at 100 stocks, and they wanted a more focused list. And so it was a very simple decision to, to move that down to the IBD 50. Now, uh, of course, if you go to the next slide, um, we have a number of lists that we've had for, you know, nearly a decade now. Most of these lists actually um, have been on or in the paper for uh, multiple decades, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them. Um, but we just kind of showed some of the performance, again, of these published lists um, relative to the S&P 500 since, since March of 2009, because we did another um, kind of, uh, we, we, we published some new lists in 2009, and so this kind of includes everything. But like the IBD Weekend Review, um, we have a long history of that. that. That goes back to, what, the 90s at least. Early um, 90s. Early 90s. Um, you know, the stocks on the move, we've been, you know, publishing that in one form or another. It used to be called where the big money is flowing, um, but we've been publishing that for a very long time. And you can just very quickly see, you know, that, you know, 20% uh, average annual growth rate is kind of, that, that, that's kind of our benchmark. If we're, if we're not getting 20%, then you know, a lot of times right, we're right. like, ah, this list isn't, you know, doing what we want. And again, these are all, you know, lists that have been published, um, you know, this, this entire time in the newspaper. Yeah, and, and they're all, in different ways based on this idea of combining technical strength uh, with fundamental strength. Mm -hmm. And, so and Justin, can you, can you talk, sorry, can you talk briefly just about how uh, sector leaders is one of those strategies in addition to the IBD 50 that we get a lot of interest in? And um, it, can you talk just briefly about how breakout, this breakout concept, the similarities in terms of the investment universes that uh, sector leaders and, and, and breakouts use, because from our perspective, it's, it's unfortunately going to be difficult to bring the sector leaders in an ETF. But um, if you could highlight the similarities between those two lists, that'd be, that'd be helpful. Yeah. So, yeah, really, a lot of times what we do here is, um, as Chris kind of suggested, is we're taking different slices and dices of the market. Um, you know, sometimes we're focusing on one thing over another. Um, of course, the problem with, you know, bringing the sector leaders to the market as an ETF itself is that, you know, sometimes you don't have very many names on the list. That's one of our most stringent criteria to get on that list. It really has to be top notch. And there are times, especially in a rougher market, where there will be zero names on that list. And that's just not something that really kind of lends itself to an ETF that is you know, supposed to be investing in stocks, to have zero <laughs> stocks. So, uh, you know, what, what the sector leaders, you know, what you are getting access to is, again, a lot of these lists, we're looking at very similar things. We're looking at those strong fundamentals, those strong technicals. Um, you know, now we're just going to be adding that breakout element. But in order to have a wide enough universe, um, you know, sector leaders, there's, you're going to see a lot of those names appear on here. That's, 
they're, they're going to be in our universe because they're so strong on the fundamental and technical side. So they just naturally make the, the original universe that we're going to be screening the breakouts off of. Does that make sense? Yeah, great. that's great. Thanks, Justin. Hmm. So yeah, let's move on to breakouts. So uh, a lot of people are pretty familiar with the breakout concept. And essentially, when a stock is trading and in an uptrend for a while, it, it will take a rest and go sideways and consolidate. And then maybe because of an earnings report or an upgrade or you know some, some bit of news, this stock will break out to a new high. And we've, we found over the years that that is a great time to enter a stock on, on an individual, especially as an individual basis. Uh, this is something that, that Bill came to uh, uh, appreciate by looking at some of the, the best investors that he learned from, uh, most notably Jack Dreyfus. He was heading a, a mutual fund at the time that was you know head and shoulders above the rest and bill started going through the the holdings and figuring out when he was buying the stocks and he I, he was surprised to see all the stocks were joining this mutual fund when they were making new highs so uh that was a big uh a, a big eye-opening um, observation on on his part and he started studying it uh, even more so breakouts have been i mean that's that's at, at the heart yeah. of <laughs> what ibd is about However, in most indexes, we we didn't really have a way to account for the breakout. We could we could look at relative strength, uh, you know, the earnings per share rating, the composite rating, all those fundamental and technical factors of, of kind of the basic, you know, how strong the stock is. But we didn't uh, did not have a way to pinpoint, at least on a uh, on an index in the early days, when a stock was in a base and breaking out. Well, and again, part of that is because um, with all of our lists, we really try to make them computer generated and automatic. You know, mm -hmm. we try and keep our emotions out of it. And, you know, that, that's where it got tough is, you know, having a computer recognize a base, um, you know, especially because, you know, Bill, you know, with Jack Dreyfus, those, those stocks that he was first looking at, that was kind of the basis of his first model book. You know, right. these are the stocks that were you know, performing the best. And he wanted to make sure he understood those. So if we go to the next slide, that kind of really plays into uh, these patterns that he kept on seeing over and over again um, when looking at the best performing stocks of each market, starting with that study of what Jack Dreyfus was doing. Um, these same patterns kept on repeating themselves over and over. And one of his favorites um, for anyone that's read any of Bill's stuff, for those that are familiar with the paper, you know that we talk a lot about the cup with handle. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we talk about it a lot is just it's one of the most prevalent that we see, mm -hmm. a chart pattern that keeps on appearing over and over and over again. And you know, one of the great things about having these patterns and, and this precedent really of, of these historical, you know, something that happens historically is that we kind of get that optimal buy point. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a new high that it needs to break out into. Um, and that's where we kind of have a little bit of advantage over momentum sometimes is, you know, we're getting something that has consolidated it's done that sideways movement, and sometimes it's actually not at a, a new new high, but it might be near a new high. It's just kind of breaking through a, a previous area of resistance, and that was something that you know was also very similar to what Jesse Livermore and Nicholas Darvis were doing. And so, because we have that optimal buy point that we can identify, and and now we can identify with a computer, um, we we have something we can work with in terms of you know really studying breakouts as a whole. Uh, with computer generated uh, precision and something to know that a lot of these patterns they they often mimic what's happening in the market overall so recently we were seeing a lot of double bottoms because the market was moving up and then pulling back and and creating this kind of choppy trade and so the stronger stocks started creating double bottom bases and we're seeing a ton of flat bases because especially last year and and now as well a lot of stocks they're they're breaking out and then they're uh, going sideways for another four or five six weeks creating a, another flat base but we you know you you go back to old model books and we've got them going back to the 1890s and you see these patterns over and over it doesn't uh, e even when people weren't looking at charts <laughs> right. didn't even know about charts yeah uh, these patterns showed up because really they're based on human emotion and it's 
just the interplay of of people you know wanting to take profits or getting in late and uh, and then uh, having to sit through a, a, a shakeout through a, a consolidation period and so they just show up over and over mm -hmm. so the next slide you know simply just kind of makes the point that what we're looking at here are really those um, those areas of resistance um, so uh, we can go ahead and skip over to uh, the can a computer identify these patterns um, to, to that slide and we can just real quickly talk about a big investment that uh, Mr. O'Neill made in terms of studying these patterns. Um, so as, as Chris suggested, one of the things he did was, you know, his, his data started back in, you know, the late 50s, early 60s, and a, a decade or about a decade, 15 years ago, yeah. he backfilled his database. Um, he got two teams just, you know, putting in all sorts of data from Wall Street Journals and New York Times going back, you know, on microfiche and everything like that, um, two teams to make sure that they had a way to, uh, you know, balance out who was making errors and who wasn't. Um, and, you know, we got to see these charts for the first time a lot of times. Um, you know, the, the last time these charts had been seen were maybe on chalkboard, you know, as, you know, kids were, you know, drawing the ticker tape, you know, prices on there for, uh, for the investors. So, um, again, seeing the fact that these, these patterns kept on occurring even back then in, you know, Tennessee coal and iron and, Bethlehem RCA. Steel, RCA in the 20s. Um, you know, it, it was it was really amazing to see these patterns, you know, just appear over and over again. And then it also kind of increased our universe of sample that we could do testing of pattern recognition. And so that was another element to get the computer to recognize these patterns. And and there's a lot of subtleties to what Bill was, you know, looking at. And we we tried to get those subtleties in in there as much as possible. Um, so the fact that we have, you know, those two elements happen in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, almost 20 years, um, you know, really kind of made this breakout concept something that we could uh, automate a lot mm -hmm. easier. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. And uh, we can talk about, you know, some of the stocks that our, our pattern recognition algorithm is, is recognizing. and um, you know, we'll be talking a little bit about, you know, some of the uh, stocks that we've we found that have, you know, been, been going on in our research, and one of them is Weight Watchers. Um, so on, on the chart here, you can see, you know, and again, this was not at a new high. You can see that first green arrow, uh, the, the one that's over to the left the most, um, it was not at a new high at that point, but you can see it was a very strong move up. In fact, some people would say maybe too strong. It was it was up I think 47% that week, you know, which is uh, you know, pretty dramatic. So you you, you got to figure something happened, you know, an earnings report or some bit of news that caused quite a bit of people to revalue the company. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that it crossed, you know, all of those levels of resistance is something that is 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 very good, you know. So we have to take a look at that and um, that's what these breakouts, you know, kind of you know, kind of feature um, you, we also can use some very simple cell rules. You know, one cell rule that we use sometimes is uh, just using the 10 week line. You know, this is something the 50 day line, the 10 week line is something a lot of people use. Um, with just this simple rule, it can really capture a lot of the profits uh, in, a, in a stock and minimize that downside risk. Um, and you will notice that right after that red arrow, it went sideways for a few months. And then there was another breakout above another area of resistance. And so this is something that would have been captured um, as well because it had all of those elements. And I, I want to make sure that we're being very clear here that when we're looking at breakouts, um, yes, we could run a screen off of every breakout that happens, but that's not what we want. We want the breakouts in the stocks that have those strong fundamentals. Um, we're looking at you know, you know, companies that have something compelling about them. Um, so they have to meet... Uh, an initial universe screen to even be considered uh, for you know uh, that that breakout universe. And what's great about uh, this index and, and which will power the ETF is you, you know especially on that first uh, breakout. I mean most people would never want to buy a stock that's up forty percent in a week and uh, you know feel that they were so extended. But in an index where you've got twenty to maybe fifty stocks, you can make a purchase like that and. 
uh, you, you know, deal with the, the pullback. It did, fall, it did pull back for three st straight weeks and then got support at the 10-week moving average. But it's just a great way to take advantage of this power that on an individual basis might be very difficult to, to pull the trigger yourself. And, you know, that's another, you know, that brings up another point where that, where an index or where a number of stocks in a portfolio like this makes sense is because they don't all work. You know, yeah. I mean, that's just, the, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, anyone who's been trading for a while knows that you're not going to hit, um, you're not going to bat a thousand. That's not the way this game works. And so um, when you get these, you know, big outperformance stocks, if you have enough of those in your portfolio or in your index, they can make or break your index. Um, you know, you, you can have a lot of stocks that don't go anywhere or even are losers. Um, if you get those big winners and you're not, you know, holding on to the losers forever, uh, you can really power your portfolio in a strong way. So let's move on to the next example. And it's one from 2017. And that is Ring Central, uh, which I think is uh, maybe powering this uh, webinar, right? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I recognized the music. Uh. Uh, and so this is a, a, another example of uh, a breakout. And that you'll see at that green arrow, the, the stock pulled back into the 10-week moving average. Um, our you know, computer recognized that as a consolidation and then broke out. Now, again, this is a, a great example of the other one, it was too strong. This one actually looks a little weak on, on how it closed, but it nevertheless did break out that week. The, the uh, index picked it up, and it wasn't a rip-roaring um, move. There were lots of you know touches of the 10-week, but it kept uh, closing above it, which mm -hmm. was really amazing how, how, how it did that. And then, you know, uh, after I guess nearly doubled, then it then it had a uh, a couple of weeks below the ten week and was kicked out. So um, I, you know we're not necessarily going to get these stocks uh, from you know the breakout to their very tip top. Right. I mean that that just especially with an index, it's very difficult to create rules that that are are so perfect because you find you start missing a lot of things mm -hmm. or you're or you're cutting out uh, stocks that that uh, otherwise give you value. But what happens is it's always looking for that next batch. And so even if something get, you know, gets kicked out and it might continue on, there's gonna be something else to replace it. Uh -huh. Now, one, one more thing we just wanna spend a little bit of time on um, on the next slide is that there are these special cases um, in, in going back historically. And again, now we have data going back to the 1890s. So we've got a lot of data that we can look at. Um, and one of the things that is really comes up over and over again as being one of the most powerful things to be looking for are these, these IPOs. Now, we're not talking about buying uh, an initial public offering, an IPO, at the, at the opening day. You know, that's, that's not what you need to do. Um, what we're talking about doing is, you know, kind of waiting for some trading history and waiting for that first base. Now, we have, again, through a lot of our history and a lot of our study over the years, um, discovered that the basis for that first, that first IPO base can be a little bit different. And mm -hmm. so we had different rules that we were allowed to program into the computer and say, hey, you know, if, it, if you had a new issue you know, within this certain amount of time, you can treat it a little differently in terms of where you put that resistance point and how you handle those breakouts. And so that's something that we wanted to make sure was was a part of anything that we did with breakouts because it's it's something that we have so much history behind um, knowing that it, it's these IPOs that can really drive uh, performance. Yeah, so typically we want a base, if it's a flat base, it needs to be uh, five weeks, cups with handle can be, they can actually be as short as six weeks. We typically want to see them seven weeks or, or longer, but if you, you know, count from that first down week, that was only a three week base. Uh -huh. But it, uh, you know, ma made a, a significant move over the next couple of weeks and then continued on. Uh -huh. So, and, and IPOs as a class are a, uh, one of the, you know, the strongest, uh, I guess, patterns, those initial bases probably outperform all the others uh -huh. as a class. So we definitely wanted to, uh, to get those in the index and take advantage of them. So let's move on to the next uh, 
slide. And uh, we, you know, we started working on this a number of months ago, uh, in part because people were were asking us, why don't you do a breakout ETF? And you know, we started thinking about it. We have this the the uh, the algorithms that are now available on our on our product market uh, market smith charts. Uh, you know, you can see the patterns on the chart and and uh, uh, take advantage of that. And so we started working on this, and uh, we wanted to test it over a long period of time. Uh, so we started with the IBD 100, and that goes back to 2003. And uh, I uh, and What's interesting, uh, the IBD 100, which is now the IBD 50, but we continue to, to still collect 100 stocks and we wanted to have a, a broader universe. And you, uh, the black line is the S&P. The blue line is the IBD 100, just as it is, the way it runs. Um, you know, Every Friday. Yeah, yeah. Every Friday, stocks make it, they get kicked out. And then the yellow line is adding an early version of the breakout concept where we had a few patterns in there. I, I don't think we even had sell rules on there, except that it would... Uh, Unless it got off the IBD 100, that was right. the only sell rule. And know? no market timing, anything yeah. like that. So, so anything would, once it got on the list, it would stay on the list as long as it remained on the IBD 100, um, you know, with, with that breakout getting it on the list. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what's very obvious is we, by by having a, uh, you know, a higher level, a, a universe that's based on fundamental strength and technical strength that's uh, rebalanced once a week, that, you know, far outperforms the, uh, the S&P, uh, probably pushing like 80 or 90 percent outperformance. But, you you know, but when you start timing things to breakouts, you get another big boost in performance. Uh -huh. And over uh, uh, this time period, you know, it's 16.4 for the IBD 100 uh, versus 11.9 without it. So that's, uh, uh, I think this is a great example of that the breakout is very important and it really clues you into when a stock is moving. So rather than having to sit through a base for you know weeks or months, you buy it as it begins to move and then we get rid of it once it stops moving and we uh, go to another one. Now, I will say since uh, this test was run, we've added a lot of uh, enhancements. Uh, we've added some other um, pattern recognition uh, uh, you know, algorithms, uh, some cell rules, different weighting. This is an equally weighted uh, right. index. We, we definitely have a conviction weighted mode where the, the stocks that have the highest probability of making bigger gains get uh, more weight. So. Uh, you know this. The, you know, the, as good as this looks, uh, I think the, the the breakout index looks a lot better. Uh -huh. And you know, one other thing is that this. You know, we we didn't just try it on the IBD 100. We actually tried it on a number of lists. Mm -hmm. You know, we were like, okay, let's try it on the 8585, and you know, and each time those breakouts, you know, really did add something. And so, you know, then it was just a matter of, okay, we know we've got a Kind of proof of concept here now how can we turn this into something that is lends itself to an etf right. so um, if you go to the next slide you can kind of you know follow along with us as we we develop this um you know and what we came up with was the ibd breakout stocks index um, we start with a universe of domestically traded stocks um, we don't want to deal with foreign currencies anything like that um, let's just keep you know we, we will deal with adrs that's fine you know but they have to trade uh, here in in the U.S., um, either on the New York, NASDAQ, uh, what have you. Um, we did have to put some minimum price and uh, liquidity rules in there because that's just what we always do. You know, mm -hmm. we always have those um, with all of our lists. We we have some minimum price and liquidity rules. Um, and then we filter the strongest stocks based on our time-tested technical and fundamental ratings. And these are not ratings that just came out, you know, a couple years ago. These are ratings, the earnings per share rating has been out for, you know, what, at least four decades. Um, you know, the composite rating is one of our uh, latest ones, and that's got two decades behind it almost now, mm -hmm. uh, along with the SMR. Uh, so these are ratings that we have a lot of history with, um, a lot of, you know, again, real time. This is how they do. This is what they give you. 
Um, so that was our first step is let's start with a good universe and as broad of a universe as we can get. And that's where sector leaders and a lot of those stocks will, you know, from our other lists will be in here uh, to make sure we've got a good universe that we're starting with. Yeah. And, and there's different types of things that we're looking for. So we get some turnaround stocks in here. We obviously the IPOs uh, are, uh, are making the list. They, they won't make a lot of our other lists, but we've got uh, exceptions for, for newer companies and things like that. So it really gives us uh, a nice universe of stocks from which to choose. And if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about step two. Right. So once we've got the universe and they, the, you know these are stocks, again, with strong fundamentals, good technicals, they've got enough liquidity, the price is high enough for us. And then we start looking at the patterns, and 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 it's not simply uh, what I guess what we found and uh, what was really interesting. We're buying breakouts, but we're also uh, buying stocks before they break out. We discovered certain patterns as stocks move up the right side of their base that became very powerful, and so we're. Uh, because we're putting all these things together, we know that they're getting close, and uh, because these patterns work so well, we can buy them before they break out. So that's another reason why this index is so powerful. But just to make sure, you know, people don't think we're buying things on the way down. We yeah. are looking at things that are showing signs of strength. So it's really, you know, they're they're on the right side of their base. You know, exactly. these, these are not on the way down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. You know, as an individual, it's very hard to make those sorts of purchases in a concentrated account. But when you're dealing with an index of 25, 50 stocks or more, that uh, approach can work very well. So once a stock enters the index because it's either broken out or it's near a breakout, uh, it stays in until uh, a sell rule kicks it out. And the, the two main buckets of sell rules, one, does it still make the universe? Does it meet all the fundamental and technical requirements? And then uh, is it holding above its moving averages? And really one of the key ones is the 10 week moving average. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for a, a close below it. It can trade below it uh, during the week, but it's really how it closes above that moving average that makes all the difference. And if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about our, our third step, which was kind of our, uh, portfolio rules, a little bit of how we would handle the index, um, the weighting and everything like that. So uh, in order to make this something that was, you know, tradable, uh, we had a minimum of 25 components, you know, so we always have at least 25 stocks. And we use our IBD ratings to come up with a rating, you know, a, a ranking, uh, as Chris mentioned, that kind of, hey, these are the ones that have the most potential. And then we give those with the most potential, the heaviest weight. So, um, let's say you had the minimum of 25 components and you know, that, that can go up. I mean, we, we've had, you know, uh, you know, 70, yeah. you know, 60, you know, 70, you know, that, that, that happens. Um, but let's say you have 25, uh, the way that we have it designed is that means that the maximum you'd have in any one stock would be 7%, which, you know, is a decent amount that can, that can make mm -hmm. a difference, uh, in, in your portfolio. So, um, that, that's our maximum starting weight. And we do have a long-term market timing element that we, we do include. Um, it's, it's a signal that doesn't happen often, but just in those really, you know, really rare situations, we want to have some protection to dampen the effect of a, a, a significant bear market. Right. And what we've learned after many years of creating and, and tracking these indexes is that short-term market timing does not help you. The little wiggles in the market, even 20% corrections are typically don't uh, matter enough to try to, to raise cash in an index. With a concentrated portfolio, that's uh -huh. you know another question. And so what we're really focused on are major bear markets and and we want to you know step to the side and, and hopefully miss about half of the damage out there. And uh, that you know so far that's th those are the triggers that have, have come in. Uh -huh. And then of course, this is going to be computer generated and, and we do a weekly rebalance and that weekly rebalance, that's that's what kind of takes care of a lot of the, the wiggles uh, on the short term, you know, because it'll just get out of the stocks that aren't working and into the stocks that have have the greater potential. Um, and so it, it helps a lot there. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about what uh, why it works. And it comes back to some of those 
elements that we've been talking about uh, already. Uh, you know, we're focusing on fundamental and technical strength. You add the, uh, you know, the, the the timing element of the breakout or the near breakout, and it, it just um, it just keeps you really focused on the very best growth stocks at any one time, the things that are moving. And because we're always uh, looking to, to, you know, looking for the next big winner, the weaker stocks are getting kicked out, the new stocks are coming in. And some, some of those stocks, if they had a, you know, if they base again and break out, we've already seen they'll rejoin the list. We're putting greater weighting on the better stocks and the, the list is big enough, you, you you don't want too tight of a list because then you might miss things. And so the way it's uh, set up, if there's a lot of things that are working and breaking out, we're going to get all of them. And then the ones that really do last, they're going to stay in the index and they'll, you know, uh, they'll uh, start generating a, a, a greater percentage of the index as well. So it, it just, uh, it, it really embodies all the principles that IBD has been writing about and, and publishing uh, lists and, and all, all sorts of other premium products for now more than three decades. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of those guiding principles really just kind of you know came to fruition in, in, in this one. Uh, so uh, one more slide here, um, some of the benefits. Uh, again, that, that index being rebalanced weekly does you know help keep you in phase, um, the, the higher turnover, where some people are afraid of that, you know, Innovator has really, you know, uh, <laughs> embraced it, you know, which we've really appreciated. Um, we have those sell rules that Im Im improve our uh, performance by reducing the drawdowns, uh, the long-term market component, as we mentioned earlier. And, you know, again, we just have a lot of history, a lot of research behind the breakout concept. And every time, you know, we've, you know, gone with one of our strong, fundamentally sound and technically sound lists, and then we apply those breakouts on it. Um, you know, you do it the right way, and it really, really makes a solid, solid improvement. So that that's one of the things that makes us really excited about um, what Innovator is going to be putting to market. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and turn it back over to Graham. Great, thanks a lot, Chris and Justin. Uh, very insightful information. Um, moving to the next slide, I, uh, we want to make sure that um, you all know that the historical index information for the IBD breakout stocks index is available. Uh, feel free to reach out to us here at Innovator. We will be sure that you are put into contact with the right person at IBD to get you all the historical information. So uh, some contact information on this slide to get all the historical index information uh, sent over to you. And, and one of the things that I want to do is to go back to uh, slide 15, because I think it's important for us to take a step back. And from an ETF issuer side, we've seen a lot of strong historical performance, um, but we don't necessarily always bring strategies that have strong historical performance to market. Um, what makes this idea very unique is that the breakout concept has been tested by IBD for decades. I think Chris and Justin went through this extensively. And that's something that you don't uh, often see to be able to have a database going back to 1890 to test a, a, a research idea like this. And from our perspective, it's a very unique idea. I think moving back to uh, slide 22, from our perspective, the IBD user that is familiar with breakouts, I think, is going to embrace this idea. Why? Because it captures the breakout premium that Chris and Justin talked about. But as I mentioned earlier, the tax efficiency of the ETF vehicle allows a strategy like this that tends to have higher turnover, more frequent rebalancing, and provides investors a tax efficient way to access uh, these types of strategies. What do I mean by that? Or what's an example? Well, in 2017, our other uh, ETF with IBD, the IBD50 ETF, was up 37%. We had over a thousand percent turnover in that portfolio, and we issued zero capital gains distributions. And so at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is to maximize your after tax uh, total return. And so the ETF structure allows you to defer taxes that you would otherwise pay if you were making all of those changes 
on your own. So like the IBD50, we think the breakout concept uh, fits very well in the, the ETF st structure. From an ETF issuer perspective as well, uh, we've brought out a lot of ETFs uh, over the years. And looking at ETF.com, we see that there are 39 uh, different momentum ETFs. So ETFs that utilize some sort of price momentum or relative strength. Uh, but what we also know is that there are no other breakout ETFs on the market today. So that's what really makes uh, gets us excited because this is a new concept that's been delivered in the best vehicle possible to access uh, this this research that IBD has has been um, using for for decades. So we think it's a powerful way to deliver uh, the, the strategy. And again, being the first to market is always a, a benefit that that we like to have. And I like this quote that IBD has has put together that often you tend to see stocks with prolonged movement, uh, bullish movement tend to have their those movements start with a breakout. And uh, this is uh, an ETF that's going to seek to capture uh, those opportunities for you. So moving forward, so why? Three, three simple reasons why you should consider buying this breakout ETF. First, it's, a, it's an idea that, as I mentioned before, has been uh, widely tested and researched uh, by IBD. And they have shown that uh, across their their list, if you if you overlay this breakout concept, it can uh, drive significant uh, outperformance. The second, there are no other there's no other way to access uh, the breakout concept today. This is the only way to do so. And again, the ETS structure is the best way to get access uh, to an idea like this. And finally, more from a portfolio allocation perspective. Um, you know, looking at how does this compare to other ETFs that I might own or uh, you know, what, what's different about this? Well, you'll see that there is really little to no overlap between the stocks that are going to be held in this ETF and existing uh, very popular momentum uh, and relative strength ETFs that are on the market today. So moving forward, I, I know many IBD users are going to be uh, familiar with what the difference between a, a, a price momentum or a stock that has strong price momentum and a stock that has breakout characteristics. And I think it's important to distinguish uh, these two concepts because at the end of the day, this is what drives the unique exposure from uh, the breakout concept. So looking at that top right chart of a price momentum, you can see that over time, there's been a, a movement higher in, in the stock price, and it's, it's gained momentum. It's had some sort of capital appreciation. And most of these relative strength and, and, and momentum ETFs are going to buy these stocks after they've had a significant move higher. So you miss out on that initial move. The breakout concept is very different because it accesses these stocks at a point where they have been up against a price uh, resistance level and buys at that point. And as Justin uh, and Chris mentioned, they're not all going to work, but when they do work, they tend to have uh, significant moves higher. And so if you can capture just a few of those, that can make a, a profound difference on uh, an ETF or, or uh, an index. Moving forward, just to summarize what Chris and Justin talked about, at the end of the day, this is a, a, a rules-based, simple uh, ETF that starts with uh, a universe of around 7,000 stocks, screens for the breakout concept, as well as strong fundamentals and technicals as identified by IBD, conviction weights it, and rebalances each week. And I think that's another key distinguisher for uh, IBD uh, ETF strategies with Innovator that we tend to rebalance on a weekly basis. And uh, again, that allows us to adapt uh, more readily with the market, but also do so in a tax efficient manner. Moving on, looking at the overlap between uh, the breakout concept and the IBD 50. I know a lot of people have reached out and expressed concern that there might be significant overlap between the two. But what we found uh, is that the breakout concept and the IBD 50 are going to have very uh, different holdings. You can see uh, in, in these two pie charts that financials are the largest sector allocation for breakouts at 41%, but only make up 5% of the IBD 50. 
so you can see there's a, a, a marked uh, difference in, in sector makeup between uh, these, these two strategies uh, at a sector level. And then moving along to the next slide, I think that this is uh, probably the most important slide to look at for, for IBD users, but also for users that are uh, uh, familiar or uh, like to incorporate the momentum factor into their ETS. This concept has little to no overlap with those ETFs. So looking at IBD 50, there, there are only five out of the 50 names of in breakout that are in the IBD 50. There's only 11 out of the 50 names that are uh, in the iShares uh, Momentum ETF, only 13% of the weight. And then relative to a, a Dorsey Wright ETF, there is no overlap. So what does that mean? It means that you are getting unique exposure to stocks that you would otherwise be missing out on. And I think this, again, highlights the differentiation factor of the breakout concept. It's not a Me Too strategy. It's the only one out there uh, in the market today. Again, it will be trading uh, this Thursday, September 13th, under the ticker BOUT. But it's the only way that you're going to be able to, to access that. So, uh, again, I think a, a unique strategy from an ETF issuer perspective uh, and we're, we're excited to, to partner with IBD on this. Um, at this time, we want to open it up to questions. So again, uh, we're going to try to get as many questions as possible in the last seven minutes that we have. Uh, the first question that we wanted to ask uh, IBD is, I mentioned, uh, Justin and Chris, that there are 39 other momentum ETFs. And the question is, why has a breakout index or ETF not been constructed uh, before? Uh, why, in your opinions, has it taken so long for a breakout ETF to come to market? Well, on our end, I mean, part of it was, you know, we we wanted to start with a list that we had a long history with already, and that's why IBD50 was the first one for us. Um, and then it was just a matter of, from there, you know, going with what, you know, I mean, I mean part of the breakout was actually a survey question that we <laughs> we did at one of our uh, webinars and, you know, ask people, what is it that you want? And um, yeah, so we, we kind of went with what our, our folks were telling us that they wanted. Um, yeah, and, and actually we didn't have the, uh, the pattern recognition um, technology until, I don't know, what, five or six years ago? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's been there for a while, but there's also, um, you know, we, we had a shift with uh, with Market Smith in terms mm -hmm. of um, who Market Smith was under. They were originally under William O'Neill and Company, our sister company. Then they moved to Investors Business Daily, and that actually that changed some things, you know, <laughs> internally. Um, so you know, yeah, there, there there were a number of things that just I think kind of came together uh, to make this happen. And then the the, the other thing I, I don't know, you know, I, I kind of understand the you know why why we're doing it right now. But as far as other outfits, I think that people don't appreciate the breakout as being so important. And I, and that's just part of our DNA. Uh -huh. uh, and I think the, the, you know, the other thing is um, it's difficult, one, to, to recognize patterns programmatically. And then there are some nuances on when to buy and when to sell, and uh, especially with an index. And we've got that uh, long, you know, that that institutional knowledge and curiosity. So I, I'm not sure that a lot of other folks could could do it or would even think of doing it. Right. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, a couple other questions. Uh, wh when does this strategy work well? When when does it not? And maybe to um, throw in a second question with that would be: How do you see the, this working with the IBD 50? Well, typically our, you know, our, our strategies work well uh, in, you know, bull markets, especially when growth uh, is, is outperforming. And so right now it's a, you know, a perfect market for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has been for a number of years. Uh, I guess what's, what's interesting about this one is it kind of has a market timing element uh, it, it built in because when the market gets weak, you don't get many breakouts. And 
and so it can be choosier. You're, you, it's just not buying any stock that meets the the basic criteria of, of uh, earnings growth and and relative strength. It has to be breaking out. So even when the market is somewhat choppy, there are going to be a select few stocks that are breaking out and going higher. And so this pulls you into those. And uh, I, so I think overall, it's going to, to um, act better just in general, even in, in some choppier markets. And then we know overall that when the market is in a full-fledged bear market, there's really no there's no place to hide. Yeah. The best place is to, to be in cash or to be in, at least in have some cash exposure because you never know when the market's going to turn and you don't want to get left behind. So uh, that's, I guess, in a nutshell, the way I think it's uh, going to work well. And mm -hmm. and we've seen it this, you know, in looking at our back tests as well. Mm -hmm. And there are times where you do have, um, you know, I mean, I remember back in, you know, 2000, between 2000 and 2003, when, you know, the NASDAQ was down 79%. Um, Yes, tech wasn't working, but you did have breakouts that were still occurring in, you know, some of our some of our stocks that we were watching. Like I remember the, the education stock. Uh, you had University of Phoenix, Apollo. Um, so, you know, again, you're not going to get a lot, but you know, if regional banks. Yeah, regional banks at that time were, and, were working. And um, uh, pharmaceuticals. Yeah, like Teva uh, right. Pharmaceuticals, um, and then a little bit closer to 2003, as we were getting closer to starting. The movement in Iraq, you saw uh, some aero, aerospace and defense. I remember, uh, I can't remember what the name of the stock was, but the, the Kevlar and armor and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, you and know. Amazon also broke out er yeah. early. Or yeah. was it eBay? It was eBay. eBay, yeah. eBay right. was in, yeah. Uh, that, that was an early one in October of 2002. So, um, you know, again, overall, you know, when the market's rough, it's, you know, it's it's going to be tough. You know, it's the the way the market works it highly correlates at those extremes uh, you know and that's what what Chris said you don't get the protection you think you have because even your diversification ends up being correlated highly um, but you know if if you're if you're finding those stocks that are still breaking out and getting some exposure to them and just kind of you know not getting too hurt on everything else um, you know it, it, it's more weather the storm at that point. Okay, great. And then the maybe the, a second to tack on, a, or I guess a third part to that question would be where we're at in the economic cycle. Do you guys think that the breakout concept can still work? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people have been calling for the end of this uh, bull market almost uh, since the day it started. So mm -hmm. uh, really, you know, I, I don't think we will break the trend until we get a recession uh you know it's been i mean how how many years has it been since we've even had an intraday 20 percent correction oh yeah what 2011 yeah uh, so maybe, maybe we got it on the nasdaq in 2015 that, right. that little mini flash crash right um but uh yeah it's it's one of those things where um yeah as the market continues to grow and, and we we just continue to see a lot of growth here mm -hmm. um and, and that's not to say that you're not going to have a down month here or there you know i mean it, it's not going to work every single day or every single month but um overall i i think as long as the market continues to chug along and if you're seeing you know positive positive action in the market indexes i think you could expect outperformance in in this index but in uh, long-term portfolio construction if you've got a number of etfs that you're, uh, I mean, you always want to have some growth stock uh, exposure. And I, quite honestly, I think this is a great vehicle because it's not, the, the breakout is going to get you into the leaders quicker and faster than uh -huh. other strategies. It's not simply going to be looking at what has done the best over the past six months or year and then move into it. So it's, it's very nimble. Uh, and uh, there's almost no way, I mean, I, I suppose there are some ways maybe some big winners might uh, be missed, but if we do miss one base, it's almost guaranteed we're going to pick them up on the next right. base or, mm -hmm. the, or, or the following base. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the back test show, uh, and what we've been running this live for um, a good, you know, portion of this year, and you know, the, the stocks that are leading are the stocks that are in the index. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, we've, we've definitely been looking at what the list produces and says, and, you know, look at it and say, yeah, that's, it's doing what it's supposed to. Exactly. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, maybe I'll just take, there's one question with regards to uh, the frequency of rebalancing and, and that causing maybe unnecessary turnover or selling of names that uh, you might otherwise want to hold. And just a reminder, just because we rebalance each week doesn't necessarily mean that we are required to make any changes. So if, if everything is, is fine and the, the stocks that are in the index um, are all showing strength and uh, the, there's no need to change, we won't make any changes. So just want to make sure that that's clear. And then um, I think we have time for one more question, but I just want to, there's a couple of questions with regards to the ETF. So just a few uh, a few logistics for the ETF launch, which again is occurring this Thursday. Uh, the initial share price for the ETF uh, will be around $25 a share. Uh, we expect uh, actually a good amount of volume day one. So uh, if you have any questions on how to trade the ETF, feel free to reach out to us here at Innovator. Um, and then I think what we want to do, Justin Chris, there's one last question for you. And that is mm -hmm. why, uh, why is there so much concentration in financials uh, today? And do you do you see that going forward? Or maybe you can uh, spend 30 seconds uh, just talking about uh, concentration historically. Well, I think what we're seeing right now is uh, financials have been basing and they're starting to break out. And so it's gravitating to that, whereas uh, a lot of other like let's say Facebook or or uh, Netflix that might have been in the index before, they've they've triggered sell rules and and they're out, uh, and so you know it's just picking up where the market is moving, and those uh, could come back in, yeah, but they're just not ready right now. Okay. So so I mean personally, uh, <laughs> <laughs> financials are not my first choice uh, when it comes to. To, you know, that, that's, that's how you can tell it's computer generated <laughs> yeah. and not Chris generated. Right, exactly. <laughs> there would never be a financial if I had anything to do with it. But the fact is, we know that it, it moves with the market. And mm -hmm. if that's where the money is moving right now, that's where we want to be. We're not going to argue with the market. And that, and that's where, you know, sometimes your opinions can just really steer you wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you. And, you know, I've been at this for a couple decades now myself. And, um, Usually it's when I'm like, oh, I, I hate those, you know, and, and that's what works, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I bring my personal opinion into it too much. So, again, we, we have that flexibility to go with what's working in the market, what's breaking out in the market, and um, we just kind of let it do it, uh, whether, you know, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And so, and, and the other thing to remember is just because there are financials in right now, that doesn't stop any mm -hmm. other stock from joining Absolutely. It tomorrow. Uh, and, and if and, the financials don't work, then they start they're dropping out. off the list mm -hmm. and they'll, uh, and then the, the stronger, you know, stocks and maybe the more dynamic stocks will, will get a, uh, a bigger weighting. Yep. Great. Th thanks a lot, uh, Chris and Justin and, and, uh, th thanks overall for your time and, uh, participation on, on today's webcast. Just a reminder again that, uh, the ticker on this ETF will be B O U T. Uh, you can probably gather that that's supposed to represent breakout, hopefully make things easy for you. But again, launching this Thursday, the 13th, uh, ticker BOUT on the NYSE. I want to thank you for joining us on today's webcast. We appreciate you taking uh, the time. And as a reminder, we will have a replay available and we'll be sending that out as soon as we're able to. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude the call. Have a great night. Thank you.